this video I'm covering things that I did for problem number two in my Project Euler practice streams. Problem number two invo involves Fibonacci numbers, so I'll do a lot of working through some relations of Fibonacci numbers to solve the problem. And then I come up with a kind of interesting object that I can multiply by itself to move through the Fibonacci sequence quickly, and I end up implementing a squaring algorithm. And then in the details of that squaring algorithm, I have to use stack memory and function calls to get it done. So some interesting new stuff happens on the assembly layer too. So let's get into it. Each new term in the Fibonacci sequence is generated by adding the previous two terms. By starting with one and two, the first two ten terms will be da 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 da. Okay, very clear. By considering the terms in the Fibonacci sequence whose values do not exceed four million, so values, not the four millionth one, but the, four, the, the ones whose values stay under four million, find the sum of the even value terms. Okay. So I could solve this problem by just brute forcing it. In this case, brute forcing would mean running a Fibonacci generator that would generate each Fibonacci number in order, finding all the even ones and accumulating them, and then stopping when we exceed 4 million, right? That would give me an answer. But I want to approach these problems with a good amount of math up front to reduce the amount of computation that happens on the other side, and so that I'm building up tools that are a little bit more high level than just you know a Fibonacci generator, but maybe something more like... Uh, an understanding of how the Fibonacci numbers relate to each other and how that can be exploited in this particular problem. So that's what I'm looking for here as I'm sort of looking at the Fibonacci numbers and trying to find relationships between them. Since the problem is about summing the even numbers, I eventually came around to the idea of highlighting the even numbers, and that's when the first big idea popped out at me. Because highlighting the even numbers, you notice that the even numbers occur every third instance or element in the Fibonacci sequence, which makes sense. They're going to come out odd, odd, even, because when you add two odds, you get an even, and then the next two sums will be an odd and an even together. So you get two more odds again, and so the pattern is just locked in odd, odd, even, odd, odd, even. And so since that's going to alternate in that particular way, it means that you can get the sum of the evens by noticing that each even number is the sum of two odd numbers before it. And so that gives me the other idea, which is that if you look at the sum of all the even numbers, that's the same thing as the sum of all the odd numbers before that even, that largest even number that you're considering. So from there, I wanted to be able to write down this idea somehow into like a mathematical identity. I wanted to be able to say that the sum of the evens would be this equal to the sum of the odds. So I needed to introduce notation that I would use for the Fibonacci sequence numbers. With that notation, I was able to write down the idea I had about odds and evens like this. You'll notice that it doesn't actually refer to odds and evens. It's doing this by the fact that the third, sixth, ninth, every third element in the sequence is the evens, and then the elements that aren't the third elements, so the first, second, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, those guys, those are all the odds. And so I have on the left-hand side multiples of three, and on the right-hand side the non-multiples of three. So I know now how I can relate the sum of the even numbers in the Fibonacci sequence to the sum of the odd numbers, and I want to get to the even numbers. So how can I use this new relationship that I have to make more progress? Well, the idea is I have these two groups, you know, in one hand, the group of all the even Fibonacci numbers, and the other group, the, the, all the odd Fibonacci numbers. And if I put those two groups together, I have all of the Fibonacci numbers. And I also know that those two separate groups, the sm small groups I have of evens and odds, have the same sums, which means I can now say something about the sum of the whole thing, because I know that the sum of the whole thing is whatever I get when I add them both together, and I know that each of them is an equal part of that whole. So in other words, I can say that the whole thing is just twice as big as the part I want. The part I want times two is equal to the whole thing. Or in the way I wrote it down here, the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers up to some multiple of three is equal to the two times the sum of all of the even Fibonacci numbers up to that same ending point. So that means I can now focus on just the problem of getting the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers up to some index, because I know once I can do that, I just take that number and divide by two, and I have the answer to the original problem. So now, how do I get the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers up to a particular point? So to answer that question, first I toyed around with it for a bit, and what I ended up doing that worked was writing down 
a table of some just examples of the values at the beginning of the sequence. So I wrote down the Fibonacci sequence on the top of a, of a table, and on the underneath those numbers, I wrote down the sums of all the numbers up to that point so that I could just stare at it and search for a pattern, and that ended up working. So what it turns out you can do is that when you want to know the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers up to a particular point in the Fibonacci sequence, you can go two past that point and subtract one. Now, why exactly does this work? I can't exactly give you a deep philo philosophical, theoretical grasp on it, but it's the pattern I spotted, and it wasn't too hard to prove that that pattern would keep holding once I knew about it. So how I could have derived that in a sort of first principles type way, I'm not sure, but I'm, in this case, all I needed was to spot the pattern and prove that it would hold forever, and that's what I did here. So what we have all put together so far is that the sum of all the even Fibonacci numbers is equal to one half of the sum of all of the Fibonacci numbers odd and even together. And that the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers is just the same thing as the Fibonacci number you find after two more iterations minus one, right? So if we can figure out what index we want to stop at, we can iterate to that index of the Fibonacci sequence, go two past it and subtract one and divide by two and we have our answer. So that's the plan. Now what we needed to do was figure out how we could quickly compute an arbitrary member, like a number in the Fibonacci sequence uh, as quickly as possible. And if we could find a good closed form way or something close to closed form, more optimized than the naive approach, I would be happy. So that's what I went on to next. So it turns out there is a closed form way to compute uh, an arbitrary element of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and we were able to just look that up on the internet and you can get the formula right off of Wikipedia. The issue with the formula is that it requires using irrational numbers. Uh, even though the Fibonacci sequence contains only integers, the closed form way of get, getting an arbitrary element in the sequence involves powers of irrationals. So to get large indexes of the Fibonacci sequence this way, I would need to get larger and lar more and more precision uh, in my arithmetic and I didn't really want to fiddle around with that and you know have to figure out if I was getting precision issues while trying to solve this problem. So that wasn't going to be a solution for how to get a value of the Fibonacci sequence at an arbitrary k, but I was at least able to use that closed form formula to solve by hand for the index we needed to be looking at to stay under 4 million. So that's what I did first and then we went on to look for a different way to compute the Fibonacci sequence elements precisely. So this part took a while, and I basically started by just thinking about the basic algorithm of iterating the Fibonacci sequence in order by applying you know, the sum of each pair to get the next element. And I was kind of trying to think of ways that I could skip through the sequence more quickly, because I figured if I can't just compute this thing closed form directly then maybe what i could do is at least not have to compute every step of the way and like go every other or faster than that maybe grow faster through the sequence somehow and so i played with a lot of ideas that involved applying the sequence multiple times and writing down formulas for applying multiple times and where that kind of led was to this idea of a matrix that would represent stepping through the fibonacci sequence multiple times in one computation so once I was onto this idea of using a matrix to represent a single step or a number of steps through the Fibonacci sequence, that got me thinking about what is the matrix that represents one step and using that as sort of a starting point. And from there, I realized that if we're going to apply, you know, k steps through the Fibonacci sequence and we know how to apply one step as a matrix, well, applying k steps is just applying that matrix multiple times. So a different way we could think about it is instead of applying this sort of single step matrix k times, we're actually taking that matrix and raising it to the power of k and then taking the result of that power and applying that matrix once. And that's a useful transformation of the problem because once we have a po problem of raising something to a power we can use what's called a squaring algorithm. A squaring algorithm is a way to compute an integer power for some kind of objects that you know how to multiply. So in this case we know how to multiply these two by two matrices and we want to be able to raise one of these matrices to an arbitrary power and we want to be able to do it quickly. So what we could do is just multiply it by itself you know with k iterations where k is the power we're trying to get to. But with a squaring algorithm what we do instead is we square the number multiple times instead of multiplying it to itself multiple times. So first we compute our matrix squared then we compute it 
to the power of 4, then we compute it to the power of 8 and 16. So we're, we're doubling the power on the matrix at each step by s multiplying it to itself. Then we can move very quickly up to our target and combine the steps along the way to get the final result. So the way you could think about this is we have a power that is some number and we're going to break it down into binary. And everywhere where we see a one in the binary, that's one of the pieces we need to combine to get the final result. So if we have a power of 32, we just square until we get to 32. If we have a power of 33, we square until we get to 32 and we mix in a power of one, right? And we can combine any of the intermediates that we'll get to create any number because we can always get a unique representation of a number in binary and then use that unique representation to combine the various step stages of squaring the matrix into a final result. So that's the idea of the squaring algorithm. Here I've kind of drawn it as a table, but when we finally put it all together, we won't need to use any memory besides the main matrix that we're squaring and the main matrix that's accumulating this thing because we can throw away the intermediates as soon as we're done with them. With that, I felt like I had enough planning and sketching out of the ideas that I was going to need, and it was time to start putting it into code and letting the rest of the details be worked out on that side of the problem. So there's a few things I had to learn about assembly to finish this one up. The first one was how to deal with situations where you're moving a literal constant value into a memory location using this Intel syntax. And the reason this is like a particular, it's like a weird little corner case of the syntax is that usually one or the other or both of these uh, operands to the MOV instruction are a register and a register name implies the size of the move. So for instance, the RAX register is a name for an eight byte register and the EAX register is a name for a four byte register. So the assembler using this syntax can just infer how many bytes we're moving and do the right thing. But in this particular case, the constant doesn't have any implied size and a memory location doesn't have any implied size. The pointer to the memory location is always uh, 64 bit but the actual memory location itself, it could be a pointer to one byte, it could be a pointer to two bytes. You know, a pointer is just a pointer and there's like a you know, gigantic number of bytes that go on and on from that pointer. So it doesn't know if we're doing a one, two, four, or eight byte move. So I had to go learn the syntax for that, which is to mark up the memory location with a size sort of uh, prefix. And they're fairly long, so like keyword putter is the one for this one. Another thing I got wrong here on my first pass was just figuring out the right syntax for a jump like to a label, which I hadn't had to do on the first problem. So I, for whatever reason, didn't think a colon would work. I don't know why I got that in my head when I was doing it, but that's what happened. And I went and read through the MASM docs on what like commands they had, or, you know, uh, I forget they call macros they had, or uh, whatever. And there's one called label. So I thought maybe that's what I needed. That was just wrong. It's just a colon, just like in C or C++. It's just a name and a colon makes a label that you can jump to. 
So another new idea here was that I had to use the call stack to store some local memory for like local variables. And that's what these moves into memory were all about. So you can see the first thing I have to do is subtract from RSP, the call stack grows down. So you subtract from RSP to get more memory that is reserved for like local variables. And then all of these are initializing a pair of structs. So this would be equivalent to some C code that looks something like this. And then at the bottom, you can see I'm undoing the change in the call stack register. So this was a good learning moment uh, to sort of see how things actually shake out when you initialize variables on the call stack. So that would have been it, except on the second day of streaming, I realized that I had an opportunity to optimize the solution a little bit more by taking advantage of one additional fact that I hadn't thought of on the first day. So I revisited this problem and I ended up putting in this extra optimization, which is relying on the fact that whenever I was making these Fibonacci steppers, I was storing three consecutive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. But if you have two consecutive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, you already know what the third one is because of the formula I have right here. If I have R1 and R2, then I can just add those together to get R3. So it was actually not useful to be storing all three, and I wanted to explore different ways I could use the relationship between R1, R2, and R3 to shrink the steppers and maybe get um, the multiply and squaring algorithms for the Fibonacci steppers to be use even less arithmetic so that they could go faster. So that's what I am doing in the next quick section.